So our game plan today is we're going to go through uh, another fund category, which is known as the, uh, uh, you know, the capital budgets and uh, our capital assets area. But more importantly, what I want to do today is um, actually, hold on one moment. I have uh, the incorrect one here for a moment. Um, anybody have uh, uh, also remind me to uh, speak to you about the um, um, I'm sorry, uh, about the capper before we, we finish, okay? Because I got several questions on it. Uh, so remind me to do that. We'll talk a little bit about that. So what I want to do is, um, I know the blackboard is, is out uh, this week. So um, hopefully we'll go through the assignments. And uh, let's do that uh, right now for chapter three and four. So we'll get that out, and this way I'll load up the other assignments so we can go through that. Okay, so um, this is, uh, this will be a good review for us too. Starting on page 103, and I'll go through this quickly so that um, is there, does everybody, is everybody ready? Okay. You've got your markers. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about these. The first question is, which of the following best describes the recommended format for the government-wide statement of activities? And stop me if you don't get it. If I give you the answer and you don't get it, so any uh, volunteers here for what the answer might be? Okay, anybody got anything other than that here, or we're good? Okay, so let's just move right along so we can finish this. Which of the following is an acceptable method of reporting depreciation expense for depreciable assets used by governmental activities? Okay, is everybody does, everybody have D? Because this was one of the hardest questions. Yes, okay, yeah. Well, it could be B or C in the text itself, it doesn't talk more clearly about uh, reporting this as an indirect expense or a separate line item. So the answer is, in fact, D, which is either B or C. Question number three, GASB standards require the fund balances of governmental funds to be classified according to whether the fund balance is spendable or non-spendable. Well, what are the four different categories that we learned? Well, we know that GASB talks about those four categories, which are restricted, committed, assigned, and unassigned, right? Okay. Um, next one. A special item differs from an extraordinary item in that a special item is what? A, which is pretty straightforward within the control of management. Anybody, everybody know the difference between extraordinary item and special item? So a uh, hurricane in Florida is? No, it's not. There, I got you. OK. So yes, you have to keep that in mind. A, hurric a, a hurricane in Florida could be ordinary because you know, that's something that we expect. And remember I gave you the example of the Sandy in New Jersey and the issue that the accounts are going to have? because we are not used to those kinds of storms in the state. So how do you define that? And I want you to think about those types of questions. Okay, number five. Um, number five deals with um, one characteristic that distinguishes other financing sources from revenues is that other financing sources are, what do you think? A, arise from debt issuance or interfund transfers in, good. Six, the process by which a legal valuation is placed on a taxable property is called? 
What's the legal prop process? Remember, it says valuation, not taxes. Okay, valuation. Valuation, it, taxes are derived from valuation. So the answer, in fact, is C. Number seven, according to GASB standards, um, what do you think? B, good. According to ba GASB standards, expenditures are classified. As I said, I want to go through these quickly because uh, unless you have questions because we've got a lot of material to cover. Number eight, under GASB requirements for external financial reporting, uh, one would find the budgetary comparison schedule there. Excellent. Either A or B, which is either under RSI or basic financial statements. God bless you. Number nine, before placing a purchase order, department should check the available appropriations are sufficient to cover the cost of the item being ordered. The type of budgetary control is achieved by reviewing what? Anybody have something else? Okay, boy, you, you have, you're, you're getting this. That's great. D, which is the answer is D, which is appropriation minus the sum of expenditures and encumbrance. Now comes question number 10, which is the journal entry to record the budget itself. Uh, what do you think that is? That is, yep, that is A. That's your standard journal entry that we find. Okay, and uh, what's our next question here? Our next question is 3, 7, right? Okay, what I'm going to do is this does have some journal entries, so I'm going to put in, um, hold on one second, I'm sorry. So what are the journal entries here? Did anyone have problems with this question, by the way? Who, what, was, what were some of the questions? OK, let's see if you can see this. Um, hold on, let me just get to the. Uh, Okay, so the first journal entry records what? So what, what is your budget? Okay, let's take a look at this. I'm sorry, you know, I seem to be having a little problem with the computer here. Just bear with me for one moment, please. It's, uh, there is some issue with the computer here, and I, as I said, I'm having a little, and unfortunately, because of the spring break, uh, Bear with me one moment while we try to figure this out here with the, uh, okay. Okay, here we go. Maybe this one, this time it worked, okay. So this is a journal entry, uh, the first journal entry, which is uh, 2.7 million. Uh, anyone have any questions? This is your classic journal entry, right? To record the budget. Everybody got that? Anybody have problems with the journal entry? Or, okay, we'll move along. Uh, this is to record the budget. The next one is, yes, you can. And I talked about that earlier, remember? So what you did was you uh, had two separate entries, one recording appropriations and the other recording 
estimated revenues. Yes. Uh, the book describes that sometimes, so that's fine. Anybody else do it that way, by the way? Okay, so we have several people who did it that way. Second one is uh, recording the cash and the revenues. Anybody have problems with that? No? Okay. Uh, third one is encumbrance entry. Anybody have issues with that? Or if you have a question, please do ask me because I'm going through this quickly so we can uh, get to the material. Encumbrance, but look at question number, the next item. Everybody understand that first journal entry, encumbrance of 29,100, and then the actual expenditure of 29,200? Everybody see that? Any questions? Okay. Yeah, you know what? Uh, yes, good question. Do we have to put the year? The book tends to do it. If you don't put the year, we just assume it's the current year. Okay? I'm sorry? B2, which one? Where again? Okay. Right here? Okay, good. All right. We'll keep on going. Now, tell me, how many of you got this one right? This is the schedule. No? A little harder. Okay, tell me, if it, tell me if you understand this. This is the budget, right? These are the actual amounts that's realized, and these are the unrealized revenues, right? Now, why this question is difficult is because this format isn't really given to you. You kind of have to think about how to construct this. Okay? Yeah? Uh, oh, okay. So you did it monthly instead of annually? Yeah. We like to do it on an annual basis, but you, I can see why you did it that way. Some places don't do it monthly, they do it quarterly. Okay? That would be, but it's usually done on an annual basis. I'm going to post the answers to this, so you don't have to copy it now. We don't take class time for this, okay? Let's take a look at the next one. See if anybody got this part right. Okay. The what? You didn't have to do sub-ledger. How many didn't do C and D? Little confusion there, huh? Okay. There was why why was the confusion? Because I asked I give you a break by telling you not to do subsidiary ledger, instead you skip two items. <laughs> all right. Okay. Since uh that's all right. It's not intentional. Yes. You're right. Okay. Next time I have to be very careful about um Okay, that's why I got some blank stares. I was wondering what was going on there, you know? Okay, all right, so that's question number. Let's move on to, uh, what other question do we have here? Do we have anything else? 310, okay. Now this one uses the format, this crazy format we have of statement of activity, but something that you should, um, you would know how to do. How many of you got the change in net position right? This is what it comes down to. This is the very last question. 310. Okay, again, I'll post this. Is there something that you don't understand? Andrew. Okay, no, that, if you put negative, if you put negative, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, the question is being able to know where to place these items. Bless you. Where to place these items because one uh, shows you program expenses and the other one shows you 
you know, general re revenues as opposed to program revenues. So you have to know where, which goes where. Yeah, okay. All right, so let's move on to quickly to chapter four, so we can do this. Um, Okay, so uh, page 158. Everybody there or? Okay. First question, um, when equipment was purchased with general fund resources, which of the following accounts would have been debited in the general fund? That's pretty good. Number two, Uses the purchase method, the inventory comes down from 85 to 75,000. What do you think happens? Excellent. Okay, number three, goods for which a purchase order has been placed at an estimated cost of 1,000 was received at an actual cost of 985. What do you think? What? D, the answer is all of the above. Which of the following items would be reported as general revenue on the government-wide statement of activities? Remember the word taxes? Taxes are always general revenue, even though these are sales taxes. Number five, now that complicated general entry, what do you think it is? B, yes. B as in boy. Anybody have something else? Okay, good, excellent. Number six, the village of Willem borrowed $1 million from a local bank by issuing 6% tax anticipation notes. So what do you think the general entry there would be? What? The answer is D, both A and B. Number seven, a pro properly prepared schedule of revenue expenditures and changes in fund balance is what? Did you say B or D? B as in boy. Okay, B, good. We're moving right along. Which of the following transactions reported on the government-wide financial statements? C, exactly. And number nine, this is an interesting question. Uh, this township receives a grant of $200,000 from the federal government upon notification that the grant has been approved, but before any activity has occurred, what do you do? Anybody have something other than A? Uh, the correct answer is A, but I, what I want to know is why is it A? Why not anything else? Because what is happening? Remember I, I talked to you about booking revenue on the grant? What is this grant used for? To do something, which is what? some activity, weatherization activity. Has any of that occurred? No, okay? And that's what that is. Number 10, a city received a $1 million cash contribution. So what do you think that is? C, good, excellent. Well, we had problems with one, but I think we were good with all the others. Let's quickly take a look at the property tax calculations. And I'll just put this answer on here so you can see. You should have, I hope you got the tax levy calculation right. Um, now there is some rounding which occurs here. But this is how a municipality or a mayor or a CFO of a mayor, for a mayor, would calculate what the tax rate is, right? And these are the general entries, pretty standard from the ones that we discussed last time, okay? Let me just go down a little bit. How many of you got that tax rate right, $2.02? Did anyone have a problem in terms of being able to calculate that tax levy? Okay, because I 
a couple of hands weren't raised. So, and how about the journal entries? The hardest part in the journal entries is that part which talks about the 6% interest and penalty was immediately due on the delinquent tax. That's your 1,214 that's being booked of the 202 which was delinquent. That's the hardest calculation there. All right, let's take a look at the next question, which is 4-7. This is a fun one because it's really not a difficult question, but you need to understand what is involved when you receive a federal grant. Okay, so um, this is what happens. Notice what it says. So you receive the grant, right? The grant does not have any eligibility requirements, which means that this is the 200,000. You defer the revenue because when can you start using the grant? From July 1, 2014. Now, everybody understand, and you know, I might not have talked about this, um, difference between calendar year and fiscal year. Calendar year is what, January 1st to? Now, a lot of public entities use fiscal year. Fiscal year begins usually for a lot of them when? July 1 to June 30th. State of New Jersey uses what? July 1 to June 30th. So when you look at questions like this, that's the hardest thing to figure out. You say fiscal year. It's for that period from July 1 through June 30th. So this is in the same calendar year for two different fiscal years. Do you see that? Okay. So we see that happening May 1, 2014. We see that being received. We get the money from the federal government on July 1, and then we basically book our revenue for the first year, and then on July 1, 2015, the same entry is made again. This is an interesting grant because the expenditures, you don't have to spend exactly $100,000 to get your money. As you can see, we only got, what, 90000 right, the first year. We have to eventually spend that much money, but that's what that is. All right, so I'm s um, any other pressing questions before we get into the new material? Yeah, yeah. You no, know, no, okay, I see what you're questioning. The, the point is, this is like your accounts payable, not to the federal government, it's to those people uh, you're paying, uh, you know, uh, who you owe money to. So basically, it's your vendors, you know, others who have given you materials or provided services. You could have made it cash, though, either cash or payable. Yep, exactly. Okay. All right, so let's get into what we want to study today, which is accounting for general capital assets and capital projects. A couple of things. First, as an introduction, this is where governmental accounting is bizarre. It's very strange from anything that you've seen in commercial accounting. And why might it be so? Why is government accounting so strange in this aspect with capital assets. Any volunteers? What happens when I, in the general fund, go and buy a police car? Do I ever capitalize the car? 
in my general fund? Never. And it, it really bothers people. It bothers them because they cannot imagine governments spending millions and millions of dollars on equipment and other things but not capitalizing them at the general fund level. So remember what I said to you? Let's go back to class one. We have what basis of accounting we have learned so far? You've learned in commercial accounting, in your intermediate and all the other accrual basis of accounting. What type of accounting are we learning in this course? Modified accrual basis. Modified accrual basis uses what? The flow of financial resources. Flow of financial resources does not care if you spend it on salaries or you spend it on buying equipment. It makes no difference. All right? So that's how we will get into it, and you will need to make sure that you don't get confused. And we'll talk about the nature and characteristics of capital assets. We'll talk about how they're acquired, depreciation of them, impairment and disposition. This is what, uh, what are some of the items that we'll hopefully cover in this class. We'll take a look at the general entries. I can teach you everything about this topic in less than five minutes, and we'll be done. So you might say, why not? <laughs> right? I could teach you everything you need to know about governmental accounting in less than an hour. And that's it. But what it doesn't do is give you, provide you the rich fabric and the basis on which this is based. And you might say, you know, why, uh, as far as, uh, the, you know, uh, when we talk about capital assets and when we talk about capital projects fund, you know, why go into the depth that we do? Well, you've got a very underli primary underlying reason, which is the CPA exam. But more importantly, when some of you might get into the audit area, you might have a governmental client. And if you know enough governmental accounting, your, your senior, your, you know, your, your supervisor might decide that they might want to send it to you send you to that client. So it's a very, very uh, important area from that aspect. So let's take a look at what are general capital assets. We all know what capital assets are, right? <coughs> they are long-lived assets, right? Hopefully have useful life of more than a year, right? They are of different types. And governments, well, there's the city hall right there, right? And um, all that we'll talk about today, you need to make keep that in mind, deals with the governmental funds, not with proprietary funds and not with fiduciary funds. They have their own rules. So how many different types of funds have we studied? General fund, special revenue fund, permanent fund, and now we're de going into capital projects fund, and Wednesday we will deal with debt service fund. Okay, So that's the first thing you need to keep in mind, is don't get these assets confused with the assets of the proprietary funds, which are your business type of activities, and your fiduciary funds, such as uh, your pension funds and others. And some of you might say, how silly. Why would a pension fund want to have uh, capital assets? Most of their assets are financial assets. It's true. There are very few capital assets. These are some of the assets that we find in government. What is one asset that you find here which you'd not find in commercial enterprises? Jenna, what do you think? Good. Excellent, excellent. You don't find infrastructure asset listed in, uh, you know, in uh, a for-profit enterprise, right? And in fact, infrastructure assets are some of the largest assets that governments have. Okay. 
And what we need to do is, and I list these, and notice we even have intangible assets. Water rights, well, not big here. If you're in California, Arizona, Nevada, big time water rights. Okay? I think San Diego gets its water from somewhere from Lake Mead or something like that. You know, just think about the valuations that occur there. Okay? Patents. Uh, basically, more in governments here, it would be software that's developed internally. Okay? That would be an intangible asset that you might capitalize. So I want you to just make sure that you understand the different categories of assets that we have uh, in, in government. And um, so now the question is, so you have these assets. What is the principal way that governments go about purchasing these assets? And again, you might say, well, the way to do it is just go out, purchase these assets. No, my question is, how do you get the resources to purchase these assets? Well, you need money, and you need lots of it, right? But how would you go about do you just take money out of your taxes that you've raised and use it? Yes, James. Yeah, exactly. And that's why we'll cover in the next topic. She, she spoke about using some type of long-term financing. And think about it. I know you guys are not financial. You're not studying finance as your major. But this isn't high finance here. Think about this. If you had an asset which had an uh, estimated life of 20 years. How would you want to finance that asset? With a liability which is one year, five year, 10 year, 20 year, or 50 years? Or 20 years or 50 years? Which one would you pick? You would want to pick a device which matches what? The life of the asset with the way you repay the liability. Now, unfortunately, in the federal government and state government, our friends have forgotten that. And what we do is we finance assets which have a lifetime of maybe 20 years with debt which is 50 years. And what does that do? Our children and our grandchildren are left with paying for an asset which has since long disappeared. So I know this is not in the book, but I want you to think about this, because it's this, this is the type of thing that really will set you apart from others, because you need to understand not just governmental accounting, but governmental finance a little bit as we deal with this topic. So what are the typical financing sources? And this is the wonderful thing about with governments. The cost of capital, and we don't measure that in government, is a lot less than a commercial enterprise. Why? Because governments can do what? Issue tax exempt debt, which in today's environment means borrowing at literally no, literally it's, the rates are so low that it's, it's incredible. So governments have the ability to issue tax-exempt bonds to do that. They get grants from other gov agencies. You can get transfers from other funds. Sometimes you can get a gift. And we'll talk about special assess assessment bonds or taxes. But the principal way governments finance their large capital assets is by doing what? By issuing bonds. And they have an incentive there because they can issue them at tax-exempt rates. And that's why investors, they always have willing investors. Investors like to buy government debt. Why? Because they know they're not going to disappear, one. And they're earning what? Tax-exempt rate. So if you were in the 30% tax bracket, it's like taking the rate, dividing it by 0.7, to come up with what? The final, your, your, you know, your taxable rate. So 
it is an interesting way that we, uh, we, we have this occurring. Now, in New Jersey, so you might say, if this is so good, governments will go crazy and start to borrow money right and left to do what they want to. In New Jersey, the state is very strict on how debt capacity is used. It is not like you can just go out and say, okay, I want to bond for this and that. And remember we talked about debt limit in the class earlier? Uh, what you have is, actually we did not talk about it, right? It is in the, yes. We did not, on Wednesday we will talk about debt limit, okay? But um, you just cannot indiscriminately go out and borrow money. Municipalities cannot do that. And that is why we have capital leases which are outside the debt limit of a municipality. And we will talk about how that is done itself. So um, the capital assets we are talking about are capital assets of the general fund, the special revenue fund, and we will talk about the capital projects fund. And we'll spend a little bit time on the capital projects fund themselves. So once again, um, how do you capitalize? What do you do in terms of? So you know, I just told you we don't capitalize, and then I turn around and give you this information. What's going on here? I'm saying that the cost principle includes invoice costs and all other, bless you, all other reasonable costs. Because where are capital assets reported on what statement? The government wide statement of net position, right? So we might not record them in the government wide, in the general fund balance sheet, but we have to record them where? In the government wide. Statement of net position, right? So when I talk about capitalization, this is what we, this is what it's referring to. So we have the invoice costs, all other necessary and reasonable costs to place the asset into use. What? If you get an asset that's donated, donated, you calculate it, uh, you show it at the fair market value. Nothing really different from what you have learned in other courses in accounting. I want you to just think about this for a moment, okay? This slide is important because this kind of puts everything together. So you capitalize the assets on an accrual basis in the government-wide statements. If you capitalize them, then what do you do? You depreciate them, right? If you don't capitalize them, do you depreciate them? No, right? So now think about this, and I know some of you will have a problem of, with this. Two bases of accounting, one here, one here. This basis of accounting looks like your commercial accounting. You capitalize and you depreciate it. On this side, it's your general fund, modified accrual basis, and it's what? You don't capitalize and you don't depreciate. Instead, when you spend money, it shows up as expenditure. This is that slide. And I want you to always think about it this way. It is going to be the same way when we talk about debt, long-term liability. And you know, uh, the rules are no different. You do not depreciate land, right? Do we depreciate land? When would you depreciate land in a, in a government? If you get this answer, you don't have to take the first exam. All right, now there's a challenge for you, right? When do you think that you would not, you would depreciate land? Yeah. Cl 
Close enough, yes. Close enough, yes. It's revenue producing asset, but I'm just talking about, yes, no, no, it's a good answer. But how about not too far from here, maybe about four miles from here, when you drive on New Jersey Turnpike, the Western Spur, on the left hand side you'll see these mountains, which are not which are man made mountains. What do they have in them? Garbage. Landfills. So what happens is when you fill up the landfill with gar garbage, the capacity of that landfill is being used. So you're actually, we don't use the word depreciate, but you are in some ways depreciating that land because what's happening? You are using the, I mean, what else could it be used for? There's nothing you can, you know, you can't build on it. The whole thing's going to collapse, right? Because of the stability issues. But there are examples of things like that where, but you know, in terms of the mining interest, if you had federal land, for instance, which was opened up for mining, de depletion would be one way where you are lessening the, the value of the land, yeah. And then, certain non-capitalized work of art, historical treasure, or similar assets. And let me just see, I was trying to find the, uh, this is from the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And I want you to put this in context, okay? I know it's kind of a little hard to read here, but I'll explain this to you. So they have the largest collection that you would find anywhere in the world, you know, from DNA samples to anything and everything in terms of natural history. Do you depreciate their collection? And the governmental account, yeah. That, okay, right. Well, no, painting, hold on. Okay, so now you reshifted from this to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, okay? Now this is, and I know I'm, I'm making this to be a big deal, but I want you to think about it, because this is why, this is what will make it fun, okay? The Gatsby decided when they were coming up with these rules that they said that if you decide to hold a collection, you know, in a setting where you displayed it to the public, you took care of it. And you didn't use that as a way to raise cash. Meaning, oh, the Metropolitan Museum is running out of cash. Let's sell one of the, the Renoir painting. And you know what? We'll balance the budget can't do that. Because what they say is that yes, you can sell the Renoir, but whatever you receive from the sale has to be put back into purchasing another art collection or piece of art or something like that. So there is that footnote of their policy on how they deal with capitalization. I want you to take a look at this because it's interesting on um, See, museum's collection policy requires that the proceeds from the sale of collection items be used for acquisition to that collection. If the asset is used to purchase the collection items, proceeds from so those items should be in a temporarily restricted area. I just thought that would be interesting to, uh, to take a look at. We'll talk more about non -pro No, basically what I'm saying is if they sell something of value, they have to use the funds raised from that for purchasing another valuable item. Well, no, th what they're saying is put it into a temporarily restricted fund and you have to use it all. You have to use it. Yes, they invest it, but they have to use it for that purpose. The whole point is you just can't sell. Every time you have run out of cash, you just can't go sell a piece of art and say, you know what, I'll balance my budget. You can't do that. Okay. Yeah. All right, and then the other thing which we'll talk about shortly is this thing called modified approach. And I want you to pay attention to this. 
because this is a very unique aspect in, in governance. All right, let me give you an example. So we have in a town, we have miles and miles of local roadways, sidewalks, and all of that. Question is, it's all infrastructure. Do we depreciate that infrastructure? And does it make sense? So the Government of Accounting Standards Board thought about this and said, you know what? This is crazy. Infrastructure assets last a very long time. Not that they are, have an infinite life, but they do last for a long time, a very long time. And if you maintain them, they can go on for a very long time, right? So they gave the municipality this option. They said, all governments will give you an option. You can depreciate it or we'll give you an easy way out. As long as you keep the condition of that asset to a certain level, you don't have to depreciate depreciate it, that asset. And I'll talk about later on that what those conditions are. Yeah. Well, yes, no, you're absolutely right. Because who polices it? It's themselves, basically. And you can see what's happening in New Jersey. What do you see with the local roads? What do you see all around the country? Same story. You think they are depreciated? Because Gatsby's rule is if you don't maintain it, you have to go back to depreciation. But do you think anybody depreciates the stuff? No. So, but it all starts with the federal government, unfortunately, and it flows down to the state and local because as I spoke to you before and we talked about this, you know, people, you know, we are deferring one of the terrible costs uh, of what we're going through in our country right now is that we're deferring everything. We're deferring maintenance. We're deferring, uh, you know, we're deferring this to the, to the, to, to generations. Remember, we talk about intergenerational equity. That's what this is. But we'll talk about this in a moment. So these are the conditions, Andrew. The four conditions that must be that you need to take care of. You need to have an up-to-date inventory of assets, a condition assessment. You need to estimate each year the amount needed to maintain it and preserve it. And <coughs> you need to document that the assets are being preserved at or above established level or condition. Now, I know I said to you that's kind of self-policing. But you know, if you were an auditor and you come in, you have the right to ask for that last one. Okay, so you want to use modified approach? You don't want to depreciate? I want you to show me the documents which show that your asset is being preserved. You have, as, you have, as an auditor, the right to demand that last piece. Once again, only applies to infrastructure assets, not to anything else except for infrastructure assets. And what is modified approach again? In lieu of depreciation, because we are supposed to depreciate and include in the cost of the various programs, right? We're supposed to depreciate assets. But only for infrastructure asset, we have an opt out. And the opt out is what? The opt out is if we do all of these things, bless you, we don't need to um, depreciate it. Uh, now we'll do a couple of journal entries, and this is, should be nothing new to look at this. This is the bizarre part of government accounting. You buy a piece of equipment for 50000 and we are expensing it in the general fund. Why? Flow of financial resources. Same thing at an accrual basis, what do we do? Capitalize it, right? This shows up in the government-wide statement of net position. 
right? This shows up as an expenditure in the statement of revenue expenditures and changes in fund balance, right? And you know what? You might say, why do they do this? And there is a reason why they do this. The reason is because state governments and local governments pretty much operate on a cash basis. They don't care if they spend it on equipment, on people's salaries and all that. They have a finite resource. It's no different than your bank account. It doesn't matter if you go buy a phone which is going to last you for two years or you do something else. That cash is gone. Okay? So that's where this, and I want you to remember this, okay? Now let's talk about capital leases. <coughs> Did you learn capital leases in your, um, in your intermediate accounting? Okay, so you learned the two types of leases, operating capital leases. Did you learn the criteria for capital leases? Yes. The four yes. items? Excellent. Okay, good. I don't have to go through that. Okay, so why do, uh, why do governments use leases? Governments like to lease assets because it gives them, remember I talked to you, a way around not having to issue debt, long-term debt. Huh? Well, this is, this is the way it works. With, for some reason, governments are restricted, and it's a good reason, as to how much long-term debt they can issue. And you might say, why are they restricted? Well, think about it this way. You own a home in a town where the government has no debt, and you feel good about it. You have very little debt. The administration changes, a new mayor comes in and says, you know what? I love to bond. I love to borrow money. I love to go out and do this and that, and it's gonna, we're going to fix this place. We're going to put new stuff in, new recreational fields, new equipment, all of that. Now they borrow, right? Your taxes aren't up yet, right? What, who's going to pay those taxes? Who's going to repay that debt? You as a taxpayer, right? So no different than the debt we have at the federal level. Somebody's got to pay it. So that's why it's in the state government's interest to make sure that governments don't go crazy borrowing money because the folks who are going to pay back are the residents of that state or that municipality itself. So what some governments do is uh, they have, uh, they enter into leasing transactions. If it's an operating lease, it's very simple. Because an operating lease is what? Simply a, an expense, right? But when it becomes a capital lease, how do we look at capital lease as if we actually acquired the piece of equipment, right? And I want you to just see how that is done. And uh, so with, uh, with capital leasing in government, by the way, the book doesn't mention this, maybe it does, but uh, it's interesting. And this happens a lot, as I said to you, when I was in a different capacity, I, I got this, you know, I had this happen to me a couple of times, uh, where I would get somebody, so we were buying a street pothole fixer. I think equipment costs like half a million dollars. What it does is there's this truck which comes in, one man operated, and basically literally within 10 minutes could fix a pothole and move on to the next. No big operation, one person operation. Costs half a million dollars. So the manufacturer of the equipment came to me and said, look, you know, this truck's going to last you at least for 10 years. Let's do a capital lease. And I said, well, okay, capital lease 10 years. Um, and he says at the end of the 10-year term, uh, you can purchase the equipment at a, what's that called? Bargain price option. Remember that? Okay. The, so I asked the next question was, what is the, the length of, what's the estimated life of this equipment? He says, well, about 12, 13 years, 
approximately, so, you know, if you keep the equipment that way. So what's the other criteria? 75% of the useful life. So that's met, right? Okay. Third, I said, well, what if the uh, thing costs 500,000? How would it work? He says, well, you make a first payment of 50,000, and then we'll calculate uh, based on your cost of capital, your tax exempt. This is a tax exempt capital lease. We'll calculate the present value of the nine, next nine payments, right? And add it to the first payment to come up with the net amount, which should be equal to what percent? At least 90%, right? Okay. So now we've met the third criteria, right? So now we are. So now we have established that it's a capital lease transaction. So the only thing which I had to do was I had to figure out what rate. And because it was a tax exempt rate, it was a little higher than if I were to go out issue debt, but that involves transaction costs. So you sign that. Now, when I signed that agreement, and this is where I started the story, there was a fiscal funding clause. You might say, what is a fiscal funding clause? Basically, what it says is, next year, if in my budget, if in our budget, we something bad happened and we didn't have money to pay these guys, and this doesn't happen with commercial leases, capital leases, I can opt out. A fiscal funding clause, I could cancel the lease based on whether I have the funds or not which is a very big opt-out, opt and they agreed. So this is, uh, this is how capital leases are actually done. So that was an example, and what we'll do now is take a break, because I just got, okay. So it's, uh, let's take a quick three, four minute break, and then come back and we'll continue. Yeah. We're going to do it on Blackboard, but we're down this week. Oh, right? yeah. You know what I'll do? I'll email it to you. I'll email everybody. Yeah. Would it make it easier? Yeah, it doesn't make a difference. I mean, All right. It will be back on Thursday. I know. I know. I know. If you can wait, if you want me to just, uh, what's your name? Joyce. Joyce. Okay. I'll e email it to you. Okay. okay? You. Yeah. Yeah, because it's it's uh, six percent, so it's eighty two two six eight. Mm -hmm. So you are. What's your question, Miss? Um, I mean, this uncapital tax. It, you know, question. I think it's ten percent as uncapital, but it's not times the this. this no, no, no. It's ten percent of this number, which is this. That's that's what that means. The ten percent of this number. Oh. Okay, that's what that means. It's not this number. It's of this. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Yes, but in this case, uh, only if it requires you to spend the money first. In this case, it didn't require you to do that. That's why. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I hope I didn't bore you guys no, too much. No, not at all. I thought it was very interesting. Actually, I mean, honestly, I did. Really? I, I, I didn't. Um, I didn't do much in government accounting at all. Yeah. Uh, and then, as I retired, I got involved in a couple of things, like my church, for example. Oh, yeah. Uh, and not for profit. Yeah. And yeah. It kind of well, me. I I have to. I, no, I have to I have to tell them stories and you know so this oh, way I think that's 
Yeah. You're, you're making it practical. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the difference between the, the fundamental principles of, of the accounting versus the way it actually works yeah. in the real world. Yeah. Well, that's what I like to do. Yeah, that's that's it very makes it kind of fun. Your experience is yeah. Really valuable. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it makes it fun. Yeah. Makes it fun. And this way, people, you know, it's in the afternoon and people are, they've so you want to capture that. Yeah, right. That's yeah. right. That's good. Yeah. But they seem pretty well. Experienced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we, we discuss a lot of real life. And, you know, they just have a difficult time. So I recognize that because they're not used to, they're just learning commercial accounting. And then to have yeah, this on yeah, top of throw it. Else in yeah, it's completely it's different. Yeah, so I you're not retired and I you're. Am, I am. I'm retired. Mm -hmm. I retired mm -hmm. a few years ago. Um, you know, what did you do before? I, I, um, I retired from Wachovia. I, I oh. We moved to Charlotte. And oh, I yeah. I became that's the general right. editor of First Union. Oh. And then we grew from 70 billion to 700 wow. billion. Wow. I was the general editor of Wachovia. Wow. And I left, and then Wells Fargo came. Wow. That's I, something. I told Alex that Wells Fargo Bank across the street yeah. here was the headquarters for First Fidelity. Oh, yes, I remember that. I remember that. That was the first thing I did. Isn't we that something? So First Fidelity. I was, oh, oh my wow. gosh, I know where that is. It's the wow. closest street from where I went to school. Isn't that something? Yeah. Like you're always smiling. Aww. That's very nice. <laughs> she always smiles. That's nice. All right, guys. Oh, new stuff. Yeah, new stuff. No, this is new stuff. Is right. Yes, this one. Yeah, you can. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, guys. Let's get. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I didn't entirely do like the same ones before. I didn't do like the general revenue. Like okay, I'll take a look at it. I'll take a, yeah, right there. There's the. Okay, let's settle down so we'll get started again. Okay. All right, guys. Let's settle down.
Okay, now the, uh, we're going to take a quick look at the, how we record this transaction. Yeah, you can give it to me, no problem. <coughs> All right, I want you to just, this is, uh, this is how we record uh, capital lease transactions, okay? So what kind of a fund is special revenue fund A? Governmental fund, right? And that uses modified accrual basis. Look at how the transactions recorded. Okay, uh, minimum pr uh, present value uh, minimum is uh, lease payment is fifty thousand. Is there any cash involved? No, because if you look at this question first, this journal entry first, there is a liability that's created. Right, this is how we would normally record a capital lease, you debit the asset and credit a liability. But look at how we do that at the fund level. We recognize it as an expenditure of 50000 and it's shown as other financing source capital lease agreement of 50000 Not revenue, but other financing source. If we have time, we'll come back and take a look at that Discuss, uh, that question 5-5. Five, five. Every capital lease transaction is recorded this way. All right, now if you had an example which I talked to you before where you had a cash payment first and then minimum lease payment, you'd also have a credit to cash. But here it's very simple because all we have is uh, the entire transactions lease payment is shown here, the minimum payment. Okay, so now let's take a look at capital asset disclosures. And um, what I want to do is I want to show you um, the disclosure from what you see in the book. Okay, so um, you're looking at the capital the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report of a Government. You go to the, the footnotes at the back and you look up capital asset disclosure. Very important disclosure for governments. It shows you different things. I want you to take a look at the top part first. This is for that city of Jacksonville. Uh, it shows you the beginning balance, the addition, any sale or reclassification or disposal and the ending balance for each asset category. Now think about the different asset categories we have here. We have capital assets that are not being depreciated, are kept separate from capital assets which are being depreciated. Then we show the accumulated depreciation on assets that are being depreciated. And this gives us what? The governmental activities net. And then we show business type activities after that. We'll cover this later. But look at the format. Separate assets which are being depreciated from assets that are not being depreciated. It's interesting that, did you notice this for city of Jacksonville? I guess they don't care for modified approach too much. Because what do you see here? Some of the infrastructure assets are being depreciated, okay? And you know what, there might be a financial strategy to that. Because maybe they're setting funds aside in lieu of depreciation. Maybe they're doing something like that. Uh, so it's interesting how this is done. But I want you to please do take a look at this. I'm going through this quickly, but um, it's important. And again, going back to our museum example, collections not capitalized. If they're not capitalized, they're not depreciated. And if you are the CFO, I'm, I bet you for a the Metropolitan or the Museum of Natural History, I bet you probably just couldn't wait to show the value of those assets. Could you imagine for the Metropolitan 
what the collection would be worth if you capitalize that? It would be like billions of dollars. But they chose not to. You know, it's a good feeling, but they chose not to. Okay? Let's take one of the paintings. All I have to do is just sell one painting. But remember the rule? Okay, we can't do that. Now, some of you might say, you know what? What if the artwork's value is expected to decline? Can you depreciate that? Well, you've got a reasonable basis, right? Yes, you could. If you expect the artwork's value to decline, it's OK, you know, because you have a basis for that. <coughs> All right. Um, we talked about this. And uh, <coughs> this basically talks about and it's no different from what you've learned in your commercial accounting class, is uh, things that you capitalize and things that you don't capitalize. Did you learn that in your accounting class? If it's maintenance item, what do you do? Do you capitalize that? Expenses. If it's something that improves or the extends the life, what do you do? No different in governmental accounting. Exactly the same thing. And it's interesting. It says, requires judgment to determine whether an asset has been enhanced or not. Okay. And this is not really a major area. I consider it to be quite minor. But uh, sometimes you might get rid of an asset. you know. Um, and when you get rid of an asset, you need to remove that from your books. Okay, And this is what we are seeing here, as I said, it's not really material. Uh, basically, in this case, a piece of machine is sold for $500. It was originally purchased for $8,000. Look at, look at how, the, how different the general entries are. At the general fund, we're only concerned about what? Cash. So what do we do? Basically, debit cash and ca credit this miscellaneous account. Governmental activities is accrual basis. Now we think about this. So what was the depreciation? Was purchased for 8,000. We removed the accumulated depreciation and removed the equipment. What does the equipment account have as a balance, normal balance? Debit, right? To remove it, what would we do? What would the accumulated depreciation has as Normal balance. Credit. To remove it, what would we do? So when you remove an asset, you just don't remove the asset. You remove the asset and the depreciation. That's what's going on. And you understand this entry, right? Okay. So I want you to just keep that in mind. OK, and here's another example where there was a loss on disposal of building, no different from the other, except again, now we have a loss. Plus, we had to demolish the building. That's why we show the expenditure. Okay, No different than the other example that we saw. Now we come to an interesting area, which is asset impairment. And I want you to just, for a moment, look at the definition. Impairment occurs if there is a significant, unexpected decline in the utility of that capital asset. So the question is, one, it has to be significant. It has to be two, it has to be unexpected. And three, it has to be permanent. Okay, Significant, unexpected, and permanent. You know what this is? It's a fancy term for writing down an asset. So if you had an asset which was worth half a million dollars, and there was a storm or you know something happened, and now you go out and you look at the asset and you say, OK, now I've got, I've got this issue with this asset. 
I bought this for half a million dollars, but in order to bring it back into shape, I have to spend $300,000. So what was the asset impaired by? The amount of impairment, 300,000, because what do I have to do? Spend 300,000 to bring it back to where it was, right? That's the first method of impairment, measuring the impairment. Okay, and we'll talk about that. Second one, the asset was worth half a million dollars. It's supposed to provide service for five years. Because of this storm, because of this damage, brand new asset, now only good for two years. Now let's make it three years. It's only good for three years. Well, you gotta write down that asset. It's not worth 500,000 anymore. What is it worth now? 300,000. That's a decline in what? The utility of that asset, right? So basically what we have is, in the next slide, you will see three methods of measuring asset impairment. I just explained to you two of them, okay? And um, let me see if this is a good example. Actually, impairments are interesting because they are so lifelike, you know? Um, Actually, you know what? We will take a look at this example because I think you'll get something out of this. Uh, an example of an impairment. We'll go to page 205. And what I want you to do is, uh, let's just take a moment to read this, which is, um, Five, six. Just take a moment to read that one paragraph there. Okay. So we have this city that um, suffered damage from a hurricane. It's been 48 years since they had the last hurricane. And it suffered some damage. The impairment is about 230,000. They're going to get 120,000 back from the insurance company. A typical example. So m the first question is when you turn over to the next page is, should the estimated impairment loss be reported as an extraordinary item or a special item? All right, I want you to think about the definition, and this is where we're gonna have some fun, right? Okay, so um, what's the definition of, for extraordinary, it has to be what? The what? unusual in nature and outside the control of, right? Management, right? Now, but th there was a hurricane 48 years ago. Tell me, is having a hurricane in this area unusual? in nature? You just answered the question, because that's what the definition. Is it unusual in nature? No. And why I picked this example was when the next storm, so Hurricane Sandy was very unusual in the way it hit New Jersey, right? But the next storm 10 years from now, or 15 years from now, of that nature, a superstorm occurs. Would it be unusual in nature? No. So 
and uh, you can argue it both ways. Some of you said because it's 48 years ago, you know, it's unusual, but it's not unusual in nature. Now, the next thing, is it a special item? Is it under the control of management or anything like that? No. So what is it? Actually, they have to show this as an ordinary cost. It's not extraordinary, and it's not special. It's what? Just an ordinary And by the way, when you report these types of things, you have to have a footnote in your, uh, in your financial statement. Okay? Later on, take a look at it and tell me if you agree with this or not. Okay? Uh, now, the next question is record the amount of the impairment. Uh, whenever you record an impairment, what are you doing? You're writing down the asset, right? How do you write down an asset by debiting or crediting it? That's why we, oops, I didn't see it there. Okay, so we credit the building by what? 230,000, we need to debit something. If it's an ordinary cost, what is it? An ordinary expense? So wherever this building belonged to what department? Parks and Recreation or something? Where whoever had it, it shows up as a program expense there. And I know it's hard for you to believe that this is an expense, but it is. And again, you need to know the definition of extraordinary and special item. By the way, what happens to the money from the insurance company? How would that be reported? The 120,000 or 100 and whatever. Uh, is it? Yeah. How would you show that? Well, just like you showed the expense, that comes in as revenue. Okay. Hundred and twenty thousand comes in re as revenue. So there is an example of how we deal with with this. By the way, there's another question as to using deflated, depreciated replacement cost approach. Very poor term. Confuses people. But basically what it is is you have a building, not a brand new building, got destroyed. The question is you go get, buy another building. The question here is can you compare the new building with the old building that you had? No. It has to be valued at the same level as your older building. And this is that fancy term for deflated depreciation replacement cost, which is, and it's hard to imagine this. If you had a building, how could you get the exact building somewhere else? You would never be able to. But this is what we attempt to measure, is what would be the cost to replace the building we had in the condition it was? And that's that third definition itself. So these are the three methods. I'd like you to know what the, these are. Okay, um, moving on further. And we talked about this, report as an extraordinary, or, but I, there was a little trick to that question because it wasn't extraordinary or it wasn't special, it was just ordinary. And I wanted to give you that example because an impairment could occur. It occurs all the time in Florida. And it's not reported as extraordinary or special because Florida has these storms and it's not considered extraordinary from our definition. Okay. Now, obviously, if you got money back, and this happens a lot with governments, you know, when uh, there's a lot of money coming out of, you know, Federal Emergency Management Association, FEMA, to governments whose assets were destroyed, and they're paying out right now tons of money to governments from you know work on beaches to anything and everything. Basically, what it's saying is, look, if it costs you a million dollars, 
and you get $900,000 from the federal government through FEMA, net the amount. So it shows up as what? 100000 Don't use the 900000 to balance your budget. Okay? Show it, net it. If it's between two periods, show it as expense in one period and show it as revenue in the other. That's what this is saying. All right, now we'll come to a pretty straight, simple piece in terms of capital assets. And actually, this is, um, so we've studied general fund, we studied special revenue fund, we studied permanent fund, capital projects fund. All right, so you're the CFO for a town. The mayor comes to you and says, you know, I like to, I've always wanted to do this. I want to construct a Department of Public Works garage for all our vehicles. Instead of being outside, we'd like to have a nice little building, you know? And he says, well, you're the C CFO. Try to figure this out for us. And you scratch your head and you say, all right, long-term asset. I think we go, go out and borrow some money. So you call your financial advisor on the phone and say, you know what, this building's gonna cost $10 million. I gotta figure out a way to finance this. What do I do? And he says, well, I'll tell you what. I'll come over, we'll have lunch, we'll talk about this. Get, comes over and says, all right, $10 million. What do you think the building will last for? About 25 years, 30 years, okay. Let's go talk to some people who can lend us this money. And I won't go into the way governments actually issue the bonds, but just let's assume in this case the government goes out and says, okay, we're going to issue 25-year serial bonds. And we haven't talked about serial bonds yet. We'll talk about it on Wednesday, okay? And uh, pay for it that way. So now you're at the closing, just like you're at your home closing when you buy a home. You've got the bank, you've got everybody ready to sign. You know, it's a big event. Well, there's a bond closing. You've got the bond council sitting there who's telling the bank that this money that's being borrowed is being borrowed at a tax exempt rate. Don't worry, we'll stand behind it. Then you've got the bond uh, underwriter, you've got the bond insurer. Everybody's together in the team and now you sit down together and the documents are signed. So now you look at the documents and one of the provisions of the bond resolution, the bond indenture, or the agreement says is, you shall deposit $10 million into your capital projects fund, a special capital projects fund. Why? What they want to do is that that $10 million that you just borrowed, you don't use it for any other purpose except for what it is intended. And you have to set up a special fund that's used to construct that building. That fund is called a capital projects fund. So you have the $10 million check wired into this fund, you deposit the check, you build your building in a year, you spend the whole $10 million, what happens to the capital projects fund? Well, project's done, you close the fund. What happens to the asset? It shows up on the government-wide statement of net position. So what I'm telling you is capital projects fund are used for construction or acquisition of long-term assets, not short-term assets not buying police cars, not buying equipment. It's for big, big, long-term assets. Do you know what one of the biggest public works project in the country was? Maybe it's exceeded now. Take a guess. What is one of the biggest public works project in the country? Didn't occur too far from here. Anyone from uh, Boston area here? The what? The Big Dig. One of the largest cost $15 billion to put this road underneath. 
And you know, it had, they had lots of problems, but one of the largest public. So we're not talking about that complexity, but that's an example of one of the largest public work projects that we have in the country. But going back to the capital projects, I want you to remember one thing, used for large projects, not little projects. N used for a projects which have, which are assets which will, are long lived. Third, once the project is done, you close the capital projects fund. Fourth, once the project is done, you take the asset and you show it in your statement of net position. True or false? Do you ever show the asset in the capital projects fund itself? The value of the asset once it's completed? Never. And it seems bizarre. How could you use an account to build a project but don't show it? Because it's just a temporary device. And why do we use it? Again, to make sure that the money is being properly used for the purpose it is. And that's what capital projects. They're used for public buildings, roads, highways. We'll talk about special assessments in a, in a moment. Okay, and I talk to you about these things. Have a project focus rather than a year-to-year -year focus. Okay. Um, these are some of the transactions, and it's really, this is um, nothing too complicated. But, uh, you know, in many places, thank God we have this. I wish it was the case with the federal government, but it's not. That you are required to obtain the approval of the citizens before you go and do these projects. So in New Jersey, I don't know if you've heard of the Green Acres program. It used to be an old program for parkland acquisition. And same thing in New Jersey when we passed the bond for uh, Rutgers and all other educational institutions of higher learning to, you know, for capital type of projects had to be approved in the Nove November ballot. So in most cases, this is required. Does it happen at the federal level? No. Do you, did you vote on the uh, bank bailout, the trillions? No, we didn't, right? We're not saying whether it's good or bad, but did we have any voice? No. Okay. And I know people might agree or disagree, but I think this is where transparency, integrity in the process all comes into play. The states are way out ahead. You know, I remember I told you in New Jersey and all other states, could we ever have a, uh, a deficit in a budget? Could we ever have an unbalanced budget? No. Could the federal government have it? Yes. Why? Because they do what? They print money, right? Okay. So here's an example. There's a federal grant that's received. These guys were lucky. They got $100,000 to put this project together. Due from federal government, they show a revenue of 100000 And again, the same entry on the governmental activities. Nothing too complicated. There's some interim work that's being done. Uh, there's 50,000 that's borrowed. Since it's borrowed, it shows up as loans payable. Why no entry in the governmental activity, by the way? Think about it. Why no general entry? OK, so general fund is a governmental fund. Capital Projects Fund is what? A governmental fund. What happens when you have interfund transactions between the same type of fund? It's like this. You're a family. Your brother borrows money from you. On your balance sheet, your external financial balance sheet for your family, do you really care to see that transaction between yourself and your brother? Same thing with governments. It basically, capital projects fund is a governmental fund, and general fund is a governmental fund. Any transaction that occurs between those two doesn't make any sense. It's just going from one pocket to another pocket. 
no, if they are different types, for instance, between proprietary funds and governmental funds, yes, you have to show that. But it's the same because governmental activities show all the funds together, right? All the governmental funds together. That's why we don't show it. Okay? Yeah. And there was a contract that was signed. Okay, we come back to the interesting thing, the encumbrances. I have to tell you a funny story. I don't know if last week, you know, after many, many years, actually my daughter was here. She was here sitting back there, and um, she wanted to just come see what, it, what I did. And I said, well, if you wanted, so I asked her at the end of the class, I said, well, Mariam, what did you learn from that class? She said, well, you know, I had no clue, but all I learned was encumbrances. There's something about encumbrances. And she said, because you kept on talking about encumbrances over and over again, you know? And uh, so, but uh, it's kind of interesting because she's really in a, she just graduated, she's in a different field altogether in pharmacology and pharmacy and pharmacology. So she had, you know, it was just a whole different experience, very, very different experience. But encumbrances, encumbrance was the word that stuck out in our mind, which is in capital projects fund, we still use encumbrance accounting because that's our control. And you know, this is a standard entry for encumbrances, right? So uh, the expenditures were recorded, 48,000. Uh, apparently the project engineer is doing a good job. They had an item which was 50,000, but they only, well, actually I shouldn't, I should reserve this because this might be the first payment, 48,000. Everybody understand the transaction that's going on here? Okay. Now I want you to take a look at this construction work in progress. Interesting thing. So you have a project going on. You're building this project. Right? How do you show that you have a million dollar project of which you completed half a million dollars at the end of December 31st, and you have to prepare your financial statements? Your government-wide statement of net position. What do you show? You spent half a million dollars. Building isn't complete yet. It's only half done, 500,000. You show it under a new type of account called construction work in progress. Okay? It's, an, it's a capital asset account. And when you finish this, you turn this into a, the real asset account. Yeah. Okay, a couple of other things. Again, this is not a class in governmental finance, but I'll tell you a little bit about how this happens. Uh, when you go out and borrow money in governments, well, so basically what happens is your financial advisor says, all right, you know what, you can I think we can borrow money at 4% because it's tax exempt. And the morning comes and you look up the pricing on the Bloomberg or whatever your source is, could be, and the rate comes out to be is it going to be exactly 4% that what your advisor said? No. Nine out of 10 probably, it probably would never happen. That would be the same. And did you learn about issuing bonds at a premium or a discount in the class yet? Good, so you know, what the, you know the reason for that, right? Now, governments don't like to issue bonds at a discount. What happens when you issue bonds at a discount? Do you get more or less than the par value of the security that you issue, less. So if you had a $5 million project and you got 4950 is that a good thing because you sold the bonds at a discount? No. So what we always do in governments is we price the bond so that you issue the bond at a premium. So if the rate was, the market rate was 4%, 
we'd give you 4.1%. By making it 4.1%, what would it happen? The bonds would carry a premium. And that premium, can you can use it anyway. But you never want to issue bonds in government at a discount. And this is what's happening. They got what? Five million and 50,000 because they paid a slightly higher interest rate. And so the building cost $5 million. They got $5 million and 50. So the project manager should be smiling. No, because that 50000 doesn't really belong to that person or the project. It goes to paying off the bond due to debt service fund. Okay? And you see, you put, you're probably familiar with this journal entry, which is premium on. And then you amortize this premium you know, using effective interest method or whatever you want to do. So that would be the journal entry. So where is this money going to? To the debt service fund to retire the debt. Uh, this is just, a, you know, they receive a capital grant, uh, cash due from federal. Okay. Let me see if there's anything unusual where you might need some help on. Uh, the, they pay off the loan, which is credit, cash, debit. Now comes the real work. A contract was signed with Capital Construction Company in the amount of five million and fifty thousand. Interesting. Wasn't the amount issued five million? They signed a contract for five million fifty. Let's find out the story here. What's going on? Okay. Which really leads to so they get partially billed, construction expenditures three million, encumbrances outstanding. They reverse that. Everybody see this? The, you reversed the amount of encumbrance. The expenditure came out exactly to what it was. This could have been cash, but here it's a liability account. S same entry. Now, this is something unusual in governments. You don't find this in other enterprises. What you have is, on large-scale projects, when I sit down with a contractor to build a building, I will tell the contractor, you know what? I'm going to withhold 5 or 10% of your payment. And the contractor will look at me and say, how could you do that? And you say, well, I'm government. Okay? And the reason is the following. When the building is completed, if there are any problems, if you've paid the contractor the entire sum, what do you have to do to get the guy to fix that? Lawsuit, exactly. They don't want to be involved in it. Very simple. You don't do your work. You know that 10% I'm holding? I'm going to hire another contractor to fix that. But at the end, if it's all done correctly, you'll get your money back. So what we do is we calculate, we put together an account called retainage payable, a contract payable retainage percentage of 150,000. In this case, you know, that 5% is. It's shown as a liability on our, on our statements. Once the contract is done, we have the inspection, everything looks good, you get paid. <coughs> so again, this keeps on going, the journal entry, and look at it, at the end, this is the last payment. They're still holding the 5%. Look at this. Upon final inspection, the city incurred $75,000 of additional costs for rework. The work was done by employees of the city's general fund. And the contractor, they took it off from the contractors and now pay the remaining sum. And this is really typical of what happens in, in, the, in the real world. This is to avoid a lot of headaches, a lot of lawsuits, and contractors don't like to, they don't like this provision, obviously. These are the closing journal entries. Um, they had a, 
Do you know why it was five million and fifty? Because they were getting a hundred thousand of revenues from elsewhere. So it's the five million dollars from the bonds and a hundred thousand from probably the general fund. And so they completed the project. What was the budget? Five million and fifty. They completed it for in for five million and forty eight and fifty two thousand is left. So where does the money go in the capital project that's left over? What do you think they should do with it? Big party? No. What do you think they should do? Remember, it was used for what? It was used for the construction of the building, right? OK, now think about from the perspective of the people who lent you the money. What would they want you to do with the $48,000? $52,000. They want you to put it into the debt service fund so there's money for them to be repaid. They want security, and that's what happened most of the time. Okay. Sometimes, in this case, there might be a case made that since the general fund gave them 100000 maybe they should return some of the money there. But it all depends on the bond provision. Well, in this case, actually, that's what happened. Interfund transfer out, 52000 The money was used to repay the general fund. They're smart. And this is how the building is capitalized at the government-wide level. Now, I want to see if there is a, uh, there are two things that I want to talk about. I know we're coming close to time, but um, by the way, so let's try to figure this out. I'll just summarize this for you quickly. We saw a lot of journal entries, and I went through them quickly. Okay. So we establish a capital projects fund. Where does it get its money from? Issuing the bonds, right? That money comes in. Right? As other financing source, right? Then what happens? We sign a contract with somebody to build a building, right? As soon as we sign the contract, what do we do? We book an encumbrance. We debit encumbrance and credit encumbrance outstanding, right? Next, we pay the contractor. What do we do? We reverse the encumbrance and we book what? Expenditure and what else? you know, uh, a credit to some retainage payable for 5% or whatever, and credit to cash, right? This is all happening in the capital projects account. What's happening at the governmental activities level? Every time we make a, because in governmental activities, there are no encumbrances, right? Every time we make a payment to the contractor, it goes into what account? Credit, cash, and debit, construction, work in progress, right? We're building this asset. That's why, did you notice the easiest entries were where? In the governmental activities area, right? This is what I'd like you to do, is think about this. So now, once the project is done, what do we do? We close all the accounts. So if its expenditure has a debit balance, what do we do? We credit it. If the other financing source for $5 million and change had a credit balance, what do we do? Debit it. Whatever the difference between those two goes into fund balance, and that fund balance is then closed to either debt service or to the general fund as interfund transfer out. So I know there were a lot of entries, but that's what it is. It's just one cycle. Okay. And there are financial statements that you will see in the book. Um, and the second bullet we'll talk about uh, in the next class. Uh, remember, again, if you don't show the asset on the governmental balance sheet, you won't show the liability. If you show the asset in the government-wide statement, you will show the liability.
two other areas. Uh, again, please do take a look at the statements. Um, they are on, uh, I think there are some illustrative statements. There's one on page 189. And just make a note to uh, take a look at that. Um, okay, now this has to do with, you know the CAFR exercise I gave you, the project? When you look at that, you're going to have an issue when you go into this area. You're going to look for capital projects fund in the state of New Jersey's financial statement or whatever state you pick, and you're not going to find it. And if you can't find it, you can't answer the question. But stop. Because in order for it to be in the statements, the primary statement, it must be what? The capital projects fund has to be a major fund. So maybe it's not a major fund. It's what? Something, it's a non-major fund. So where do you look for that information now? If you don't find it in the uh, statement of net position, you have to go into and write this down into the combining statements, okay, which are at the end. They're combining statements. And some of you might not even find it there because they don't use this capital. They don't haven't utilized it or it's not enough. I'll give you an example. If you spend $10 million in a town, it could become major or something that you think about. If you spend $10 million on something in the state of New Jersey, does it make it major with a $30 billion budget or $20 billion budget? No. It might not even show up as a capital projects fund. So for some of you, this will be a very easy capper exercise. Because when you go through it, you go to part B, you look for the capital projects, and they're nowhere to be found. You go into the CAFR, you type in search, under search capital projects, and you find nothing. Well, it's your lucky day. Because you really don't, it's not there. So when you go through it, please don't feel like you're missing something. Because at town level, you'll find it, but at state level, you might not find it. Um, And this is, by the way, just make a note, this is part B of the CAFR exercise that I just spoke to you. B as in boy. The other thing, uh, I had several questions on the CAFR. Um, we're going to cover the CAFR exercises from chapter one through 11 only. That's where it ends. That's where our study of governmental accounting ends. And that's it. Okay, so it's everything through there. I wanted to make sure I, uh, it's the, the part where it ends with the audit, I believe. Okay? And I'll try to talk about the CAFR each week so you know what you'll be faced with. Okay. Um, just two things before we stop. And uh, one is, um, actually, we won't talk about capitalization of interest. You've always learned what? When you in incur interest during the cost, during construction of a project, what do you do with interest? All right, after we have to change our cap. We have to actually, it doesn't work that way in government. We do not capitalize interest associated with financing the project. We just don't do that. If it's business type of activity, yes, we do, because it's based on what? Accrual basis. So just remember that, that interest costs are reported at the government-wide level as in, here. Let me see, oops, sorry. For general capital asset, interest costs incurred during construction are not capitalized, but interest costs are reported as interest expense, right? If you don't capitalize it, you have to do what? Show it as an expense. Strange, but that's how it works in government. Okay. 
So that's one thing. The other thing which is, and I can talk about, you know, my, my love really is governmental finance. And I can talk about this a lot. But um, there's something called arbitrage rebate. And this sounds, sounds complicated, but it isn't. Governments have the ability to do what? Borrow money at tax exempt rate, right? If you're the CFO, you've just hit the gold mine. So what can you do? Borrow at tax exempt rate and invest at what? Taxable rate. You got it made. Borrow at 4% and invest it at 6% in a safe instrument. Perpetual money making machine. And a lot of financial people are attracted by that. They get so excited, but there are rules on this. So if you borrow $5 million, you spend the entire $5 million within the first six months. Now, this is not in the book. Any interest that's earned, you can keep it. No problem. Second rule, if you borrow $5 million, you have to spend 85% of the proceeds of the, that bond within three years. So you say, what happens if I don't? Well, third one, and I'll tell you what happens. You borrow money, and you decide to go crazy. You say, you know what? I need, I'm spending money, the project's just taking too long. And then I'm in putting this money, and really, uh, my cost of debt is 2%, and I'm investing at 4%. with some extra money for the project. I think it's a great idea. Arbitrage rebate says you cannot make money on tax exempt money. The net interest rate on your investments cannot exceed the interest that you are paying on that. So if you are paying 2%, you cannot make more than 2%. If you do, you got to rebate it back to the federal government. And if you decide not to do that, they will invoke your tax exemption. It's a very, very strong rule, and auditors are required to verify that. And that's called the arbitrage rebate, which is uh, this thing where people are really, CFOs are attracted and say, wow, we can invest this at much, much higher rate. No, 